there's a meme going around the internet right now. It asks a question something like, now that the pandemic's over, what excuse am I going to use to get out of the things I don't want to do? That's sort of cute. So right now, as I'm recording this video, about 600,000 people have died because of COVID-19 in the United States. At the same time, about a quarter of the adult population has received a vaccine in the United States. Experts tell us that most countries won't reach 25% of their population being vaccinated by the end of 2021. Back in the United States, about a quarter of people have said they will not be vaccinated. As the vaccinations continue to increase, as people are not being vaccinated either because of lack of availability or refusal, the virus itself keeps mutating. And that's what viruses do. They infect and replicate and mutate and then different uh, variations of the virus, different variants emerge. And I trust that science will come up with ways to address these variants. I'm not overly concerned about that. Uh, it may be changes in the, the vaccine or it may be booster shots or whatever, what have you. But at this point, the pandemic is not over. The pandemic is changing. It's continuing. And the World Health Organization has said that we could be facing the worst of the pandemic. And part of this is because we're living in this multi-tiered kind of reality where some people like me are fully vaccinated and other people won't get vaccinated or can't get vaccinated and variants can keep emerging in this process. So today, what I want to talk about is how we move forward in living in the pandemic in this confusing reality where there are mixed messages and a very loud message in the United States is to return to normal. But I'm not sure what normal is. It's not going to be the normal of before the pandemic. So it's about trying to understand how we are moving into the future, living in an ongoing pandemic that's changing once again. In a previous video, Pandemic Living, Spirituality, Change, and Thriving, I talked about living in the change that's related to the pandemic. So that's an important video to watch. But we're having new changes face us. So in this video, I really want to talk about how we move into those changes how we learn to live in the situation that continues to evolve while realizing we're carrying a lot of grief with us as well as trying to make decisions for our future. So this is a great time to subscribe to this YouTube channel and to click that bell so that you know more about other videos as they come as we continue looking more at what is coming in our future and how we can live into it. As I record this, approximately 600,000 people in the United States have died because of COVID-19. I want to put that figure in perspective. The number of Americans who died in World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War combined was less than 600,000. So within a year, the death toll in the United States because of the pandemic has been very significant. That means that many of us are experiencing a great deal of loss and grief. We've experienced loss because of all the changes, but many of us are experiencing traumatic grief because of the way our loved ones died. Remember that those who have died often died in intensive care units. They were on respirators having been intubated. They may have been there a few days or a couple of weeks but they were alone and isolated. Family members couldn't visit. People couldn't say goodbye. They couldn't offer comfort. And then our funeral rituals have been abbreviated. Generally, only immediate family members could participate in funerals. 
And in some places, the restrictions were so strong that those funerals had to be graveside. And even in some places, family members couldn't come to the graveside. They had to stay at their cars and look on at the service happening. All of this makes grief much more complicated. In the video, Loss, Bereavement, and Grief, I talk about the individual process of bereavement. And that's an important video to pay attention to. But we're also dealing with being a society and communities in grief. Researcher Kenneth Doka coined the term disenfranchised grief. Disenfranchised grief, which is also sometimes called hidden grief, is when the experience of loss isn't clear in society. It isn't recognized. It isn't acknowledged. And because of these COVID-19 deaths and the number of deaths, much of, of the bereavement people are experiencing just isn't being recognized. There's a stigma around having died because of COVID, as if you've done something wrong to get infected. There's a sense that there's just something wrong about these deaths and we can't acknowledge them. And as a society, we're really not talking about them. We're instead talking about trying to get the economy started in ways that it used to be. It's important for us socially and communally to address this issue of bereavement in society. Whenever people don't address their grief individually, what they're going through as individuals, there's a likelihood that they'll experience a higher rate of mental health disorders. But it comes out differently in a social setting. People become more angry with each other and are less patient, more difficult to get along with. They want to take sides and see right and wrong. And they will often see things in very absolute terms and, and just really become extreporous. So it's important for society's harmony and for individual health that we learn to talk about the enormity of the loss that we've experienced. And this is very significant loss. Ways that we've learned to do that have come mostly from the AIDS pandemic. The World Health Organization stepped in pretty quickly and named December 1st as World AIDS Day. And that became a day when people could have public memorials for those who have died, but also commit to continue to do education and provide services for people living with AIDS. The Names Project, the AIDS Memorial Quilt, emerged from a group of activists in the Bay Area led by Cleve Jones. And that proved to be a very powerful way for people to move through bereavement and grief in a communal setting. Friends and family members would make quilt panels that were then connected together. And these quilt panels were in memory of individuals who died. And together we were able to get a sense of, of this, the broad stroke of death that occurred and to remember and to memorialize. Those panels still t are displayed around the country and they're an important reminder of our need to move socially through grief. Houses of worship through the AIDS pandemic were also responsive with many offering prayers on a regular basis, including on each weekly service, as well as having memorials within their churches, their synagogues, their mosques, lighting candles in memory of those who passed and things like that. If our elected officials don't lead us in this direction, we need to do this and create ways to mem memorialize and to remember those who have lost so that we can move forward with our lives. You see, the pandemic isn't over. We may have vaccines now, but people will continue to be infected. We're gonna move into a stage where more things become open and we'll need booster shots. The scientists are already telling us that, but there are still gonna be precautions we need to take. Further, the changes that happened in the past year because of the pandemic, many of them are gonna be incorporated into our lives. 
So we need to be able to remain flexible and open to change as we adapt to the changes that have occurred. And part of how we will have that openness, that flexibility to move into the future is by really working to resolve the grief we've experienced and to recognize the loss for what it really has been. Recently, in one evening, a friend of mine called sharing his experience after receiving the second vaccine dose. He was excited. He felt a sense of relief because now he had some real protection in the midst of this pandemic. I ex have experienced that through my own vaccination. And it's, it's a, I recommend it for everybody, get your vaccine. But one of the things he talked about was the sense of pressure he feels to get back to the way he used to live and not wanting to do that. He used to work in an office. He doesn't want to return to the office. He used to frequently eat out and enjoyed particularly having breakfast out, but he doesn't want to go to restaurants any longer. He would enjoy movies and going to art performances and to art shows and to other things, but doesn't really want to do any of that anymore. As he talked about all of that, he explained that he has new habits and he's comfortable with the way he's living. He's grown to appreciate the simpler life he has that isn't cluttered with as many things. But yet he feels this sort of pressure from people that now that he's vaccinated, he should go out and do things, but he likes the life he has. It wasn't long after that that I spoke with a couple who were friends of mine. They've also been vaccinated and they've been talking about what their life will look like in the future. They used to hold a lot of parties at their home, both outdoors and indoors and were involved in the Neighborhood Association and would plan events. They are very social people and were always enjoying going out and being with others. But over this year of the pandemic, their life shrunk down and they told me that really they've only been spending time with two other couples who form their bubble. And they like it. They like the simpler life. They really don't want to get back to living the faster life with all kinds of social engagements the way they used to. It's an odd kind of dilemma, but I understand it because there is a lot of rhetoric going on about returning to the way things were. Well, let's be honest, we're never returning to the way things were. That was a year, year and a half ago now. And life has changed. We're different people now. And we, we have incorporated new patterns, new habits, new ways of doing things. And those will continue to be part of our life in the future. We may return to doing some things, but there are many things that, that have changed in how we will do them. But my point in all of this is that it's important for you to think about how it is that you want to live, that once you are vaccinated, what do you want your life to look like? And it's important to make decisions wisely. One of the things that all spiritual teachers tell us is that it's important to lead a simple clutter-free life so that we can be focused and present in the moment, so that we can live mindfully. And one of the things that the pandemic has done for us is helped us clear out a lot of what was probably clutter and, and enabled us to live in ways that are simpler. Many people have enjoyed learning how to cook, whether it's baking bread or making other dishes. They've enjoyed learning to spend time with family in ways that they hadn't before, like having regular game nights. For myself, I grew tired very quickly of watching TV streaming. 
I began to read mystery novels. Now, in the past, I always read a lot, but it was normally professional reading and academic reading. But it didn't take long before I was reading a mystery novel every week. And I like it. It takes me to a different place, and I, I simply enjoy spending an hour or two each evening before bed reading a novel. I'm going to keep doing that because I enjoy it. Think about what has brought you joy through this pandemic, the changes that you've made that have enhanced your life. Those are things to hold on to as we move forward. Because the pandemic really isn't ending. It's changing. Vaccines are available, but people are still being infected. As we continue to move forward, Remember that it's important for you to stay grounded and be informed and make decisions that enhance your life. Thanks for being here today. Be sure to subscribe to this channel, like this video, click the bell, and share this video with other people. Thank you very much.